Welcome to Peacemakers, an interview style podcast where you'll hear and learn from world changers, ministry leaders, creatives, and many others who are influencing change and bringing peace to those around them. We're so excited that you're tuning in. Here's your host, Jonathan Moya. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Peacemakers. I'm super excited for today's conversation. Today's guest is a good friend of mine named Cesar Castellanos. I know Cesar as the area director of Young Life in Richfield, Minnesota, but he is also a speaker, a creative artist, among many other things that he does. He lives in Richfield, Minnesota with his wife, Kate, and two daughters. Cesar has been a youth worker with middle school and high school students for nearly 20 years. Some would say that he's a professional kid. You know, he likes to say that he's a teenager with 20 years of experience. So without further ado, let's welcome Cesar. Hello, hello. Good to be with you, Jan. Yes, thank you so much for joining me and for taking the time away from family right now to record this podcast with us. I didn't have a long commute. I had to just go upstairs. So <laughs> like everyone quarantined, my family's downstairs. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, hey, I am so excited to be speaking with you today. I think that what you have for us today will be just extremely important. You and I have been texting here in the last couple of days about some things that we want to talk about. And I'm just excited to share a little bit more of your story, to hear your story and your perspective, I think, in this pandemic season. You know, not only is the work that you're doing really important, but I feel like over time and through our friendship, you have encouraged me, you've motivated me, and you've pushed me. And I think in all of those ways, you know, have been really constructive for my personal life. And so why don't we start with just who is Cesar, but not Cesar right now. Let's start like, who is Cesar as a kid? Where'd you come from? Where's your family from? Take us there. It could take us a long time, but I'll do my best just to kind of give you the big picture. But who I am, I mean, I'm still discovering that, obviously, and, and refining who I feel I'm called to become. But I grew up in Minnesota and uh, my parents moved to Minnesota from the Philippines in the 70s. Mm. And I wasn't born until 81. And so my childhood was in Fridley, Minnesota. And I knew that uh, my family looked different than my friends' families. People couldn't say my name. And so my, my parents actually, my, my family called me JR because my dad's name is Cesar. Okay. So I was just known as JR until I got to school. I just, I remember vividly my, you know, kindergarten. I was on a little train set and my teacher comes up and she said, Do you want to be called Cesar or Caesar? Hmm. And I just, I just remember saying what the first thing she said. And because I was like, I should probably, I probably looking back, I should have said JR because yeah. <laughs> my name gets mispronounced all the time and for good reason. But I said Cesar and that's kind of who I was. But then also in that navigating where I fit in, because I didn't have to go far to, to realize I didn't look like my friends. Hmm. You know, mo- most of my friends at the time, like well, pretty much all my friends, except for one guy named Tony Kwong, he was Chinese, uh-huh. but everyone else was white. But uh, I had a fully Spanish name, but the box that I had to check was Asian Pacific Islander because mm. I'm Filipino. Yeah. And so I just know growing up, you know, a joyful kid that had friends. I didn't feel excluded because I looked different. Uh-huh. I think I might self excluded myself because I just knew my family ate different foods and yep. my house smelled differently. And, and, and kids would just make those comments of like, oh, your parents cooking? I'm like, they're always cooking. Are you not, your parents not always cooking? Like, what's wrong with your parents? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just remember just navigating those little things about mm. culturally, my family's different. And, you know, looking back, I, I just wanted to fit in. And so it's mm. not that I wanted to abandon my culture. I just didn't want to stand out more than I already knew that I did. For sure. And so I think out of survival, I just adapted and, you know, Filipinos are really unique because the national language is English. Hmm. Like if you live in the city, you needed to know English. And so when my parents moved, it wasn't necessary to, to live next to other Filipinos because yeah. they knew the language. Uh-huh. And so immigrants, when they move nowadays, when they come to the U.S., you, you attach to communities that can speak your language. Hmm. But if you come in already knowing Filipinos would come and they just wanted to be around uh, good education. 
And yeah. so it wasn't necessary that you needed to be right next to other Filipinos. The Filipino community was spread out all over the Twin Cities. And so I didn't learn all of that until like later on. So kind of growing up through that middle school, you know, elementary school, middle school and high school, I just remember having to dodge racial comments and mm. laugh with my friends, but kind of hurt inside and then have these weird perspectives about, you know, other races. But then I'd look, I'm like, well, that's kind of me. I'm like, what am I doing? And yeah, and so that's, that's carried on. And I, I think for me now, I always say you live your life forward and you understand it backwards. Mm -hmm. I think I was trying to fit in and realizing I don't fit in anywhere. Mm. <laughs> I realize I kind of have access everywhere. Yeah. Uh, because I'm ethnically ambiguous, people don't know where to put me. <laughs> yeah. And so I've learned to take my biggest insecurities as a kid and use them as a great asset as an adult. And so, you know, people speak to me in Spanish because they see my name <laughs> and I'm brown and they're like, hola, amigo. And I, I say, hola, no hablo espanol. And then they judge me because they think I'm, you know, a Spanish speaking person that is choosing yeah. to abandon my culture. Oh my goodness. And so when I go to like a Mexican restaurant, they're like, hola. I'm like, hi. <laughs> and they just stare me down as if I just, you know, destroyed their culture. And I'm like, dude, I'm Asian, bro. Like, yeah. that's not it. And um, and usually if people know I'm Filipino, I'm like, L let me guess. You have a friend that's Filipino and they look just like me. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, do you know him? And I'm like, I get it. I get it. So usually, I mean, I can tell, you know, Filipinos and Cambodians are different in and it is, it's perspective. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a long, you know, answer to your question, but that's a little bit of my journey tied to this conversation of who am I? I'm someone that doesn't belong anywhere, but in a way has access everywhere. Yeah. And instead of hiding in my corner, I want to kind of leverage the platform of attention Yeah. and, and use it for good. One, I'll kind of throw this story in there too, because I think it kind of pushes us forward in, the, in a bigger conversation. Uh, I don't know if you know John Perkins, mm -hmm. but John Perkins came and I'd seen him at conferences and seen him speak in front of, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. And here he is at Hope Church. I'm like, what is he doing here? And I remember at lunch, he comes up to me and he goes, what are you doing here? I go, I'm, I'm on staff here. And he goes, I know you're on staff. I'm, I'm speaking to your staff, but what are you doing here? You don't look like them. And I'm like, dude, John Perkins calling me out. Yeah. And then I kind of backed up and I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm Filipino. I got a Spanish name, this comedian. And I just kind of just am stumbling over my explanation of how I got to this all white staff and me. And he goes, when you walk into a room, you have their attention because you don't look like them. Hmm. And he said, you have to know what you're going to say. You have their attention. They either love you, they either hate you, or they're intrigued by you, but you have their attention. You need to know what you're going to say. Yeah. And that was the first time I remember really wanting to own that platform, not back up and make excuses. Well, you know, I grew up in a white suburb and I have a Spanish name, but I'm Asian yeah. and kind of played it off that way. That was the first time I just said, you know what, I do have someone's attention and how I respond, whether anger or inspiration, how I respond to however they're kind of viewing me is really important. And my words are going to matter and my attitude is going to matter. And so it's good because I think uh, we all need to have context, right? Especially about some of the things that I want to discuss with you. And so I think setting the context and the background of where, where we come from, so much of that shapes who we are today. And so much of that shapes our perspective and our understanding of the world. And I think you've helped me even filter some of that in my own life and, and work through some of that in my own life. And so I appreciate you sharing all of that because it is deep. It's not sometimes the who we are question. It isn't just who, who we are today. It's it today is who we've become right from mm -hmm. yeah. literally i'm 34 from like 34 years ago till now and i think that's so important so i won't i won't say how old i am but i'm older than <laughs> young yeah well you know we're we're still young we're still young so you talked a little bit about 
um, your upbringing. You talked a little bit about your background and your parents. And how has that played a part into the things that you're involved today? You said you have access to different things. You're a part of, of many, I would say, many ministries and, and influence in many in many ministries as well. So what is, where do you focus your time right now? What does life currently look like? I, when people ask me what I do, I always ask, it depends who's asking. Uh, because, you know, right now I have some titles and I have some work, but at the core, not like just my ethnicity, my job is ambiguous. And I, I kind of like it that way because, you know, when someone asks, are you a Christian? I'm like, depends who's asking because you define what you say a Christian is, because if it's hates people votes this way, does that, then I might say no. And so even when people say, well, so what do you do? Sometimes I lead with, Oh, I'm, I'm a public speaker or I'm a youth worker. Mm-hmm. I don't say, Oh, I'm a, t- I, I'm a, a minister for preaching at a church. Yeah. I don't know what people think. And and the thing is, I, I didn't grow up saying, Oh, I want to work in a church. I want to you know, be a youth speaker at youth camps. It was, I stumbled upon my career. The way that I view what I do is is that I I view my life as a playground and I get to play in a lot of different places. Some people have one job and they get the swing set. Young life is a swing set for me. The clothing company started, that's the slide. My public speaking opportunities you know, that's the monkey bars. And I try to back up and say, Hey, that's fine. You can play on the swing set, but I want to do all this stuff. I want to, I want to be live life to the full. And so what do I do? I, I create, I try to inspire people. And and if I could boil down to like, what do I do? My, my job is to live life to the full and inspire other people to, to live life to the full. Yeah. And I try to do that through speaking, teaching, you know, personal coaching, uh, and just living differently. And so I don't count my hours. I look at my calendar like a month. I have to back up and just look at everything in big picture and say, oh, okay, here's what I get to do. At the end of the day, what I want to do is have people living the best version of themselves, knowing that's what we're all created to do. For sure. Uh, and my foundation focus and my motivation is, you know, Christ. I mean, that's just at my core. And sometimes I have to share that and sometimes I don't. So talk a little bit about that. I think your foundation at the core is Christ. Would you say that that's where your passion comes from? Because in all the things that you're describing, I can see Christ being the foundation can really motivate your involvement and in, in your impact in all those different areas. It's going to sound like I'm not answering the question, but I'm, I, I am. I'll get there. But <laughs> I remember taking a uh, in college, I took an arts course, uh, Creativity in the Fine Arts. And I remember on the final, it said, from these paintings that we did not study, match them with the artist. Hmm. And I remember looking around thinking, is this a trick question? Like, we didn't look at these paintings. We've never seen these paintings before. Like, how is this on the final? Like, this isn't fair. And then I remember looking at it. I'm like, oh, look at the brush strokes of that. Look at that. Hmm. I'm like, oh, that's Picasso. And I'm like, oh, look at this one. Like, this is, oh, that's Van Gogh for sure. And I remember just like looking at the artwork and realizing how much I knew by studying the art. Yeah. And when I looked at the art, I'm like, if I know the art, I know the artist. Hmm. And I remember Ephesians 2.10. That was like a verse that was just ruminating in my, like in my mind. And it's, you know, we are God's workmanship, his, his artwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. And putting those two like things together, I realized if I knew my gifts and talents, the art, I would know my artist. Hmm. I just truly believe that in that moment. And I also realized that people aren't looking for God. I wasn't looking for God. I was looking for community and I found friends that led me to Jesus. I wasn't looking for Jesus. I realized that, you know what, people aren't looking for Jesus or God, but everyone's trying to find themselves. Yeah. And if I can get them to understand who they are, they're going to be better off. Find they'll, they'll be more in line to find Jesus, their, their creator. Yeah. You know, if they understand who gave them their talents and say, wow, I'm really good at this. And I didn't do that. Like, this is a gift. Where'd I get it? they'd be closer to figuring out who their, who their artist really is. And so that leads 
like big picture. That's my hope. You know, I know people aren't looking for Jesus. Some people are, and and I'll, I'll give you the scripture. I'll do that. But most people like gravitate towards like not nothing against Enneagram. I mean, I don't love it, but I get it. What are you on the Enneagram? I'm a seven, but I don't, I don't really (laughs) study it enough. And then people are, Oh, you're so a seven. (laughs) But the thing is everybody is so hungry for anyone or anything to tell them who they are. Mm, Yeah. But so if, if you tell me I'm a seven, then I'm a seven. I know my identity. And then, then I just base my life off what something told me. But the thing is, Enneagram doesn't tell you, you need to change. Hmm. Like Jesus does. That's the problem with Jesus. Like huh. you get to a point where you find yourself and he's saying, no, you got to, you got to, you got to die to that. You got to give something up. People would rather have something, tell them who they are and they just accept it and roll with it versus having to change anything about their life. And so at the end of the day, everyone's hungry for who they are and, and will gravitate towards anything that will tell us. Well, that was really good, Cesar. Thanks for, for sharing that. Tell us a little bit about the youth that you work with on a regular basis. I know that you're obviously not right now. I know that in the past you're in schools all the time. I mean, there's kids around you all the time, students from uh, Richfield and, and other places. And, and your passion is to continue to develop them, empower them, encourage them and assist them in, in, in difficult times. And tell us a little bit about that. And then we'll move on to how some of the students that you work with are part of vulnerable communities, you know, especially during this pandemic that we're living in. Yeah, I mean, like I said, growing up, I grew up in Fridley at the time. Uh, was a predominantly white suburb. And so the culture I was part of was mostly white. And I would go to Filipino functions. And so I, I just have to learn how to navigate culture. I grew up like that. And playing sports uh, gave me a little bit more diversity around, you know, I played basketball. And so I got to meet, you know, people I played against, you know, white, African American, uh, you know, other people. And, and so I've just, grew up learning how to navigate different cultures and different types of students. And so when I went, uh, you know, I went to Bethel for two years and that's a predominantly white culture. And I, I volunteered in the schools that I volunteered were predominantly white. I knew that cause I grew up in it. When I transferred to Westmont college, uh, and I'm in Santa Barbara, I'm a- around, you know, wealthy people in Montecito, but I was also serving, you know, a, a, a lower income, you know, demographic in, in Carpinteria. And so I was navigating super wealthy white people and also serving Hispanic communities mm. and that were, were not wealthy and, and were in high poverty. And so I found myself becoming the bridge between people that have nothing mm. and people that have too much. Uh, fast forward to, you know, Richfield, it's a really unique community. Yeah. Uh, the school is 70 percent. A free and reduced lunch, the school mm. school district, and so there are there is poverty, but there are also people that that have the means to to get whatever they want. And uh, working with Hope Church, there are people that have the means, and then there we're right next to an apartment building where a lot of our students come from that have a lot of needs. And so I found myself either speaking or teaching or in schools where I have access to both people that have. Uh, money and access and ha- people that have a lot of needs and a lot of poverty. Overall, I work with a bunch of different types of students and families, uh, and I feel comfortable working with a bunch of different types of students and families. And that's that's kind of uh, my experience leads to where I am now. What are some of the realities that maybe some of your students are facing during this pandemic? I think part of uh, where this thought comes from is that I've been really wrestling with the fact that yes, we're quarantining. Yes, it's hard. It's unforeseeable times. But at the same time, I sit here in a comfortable couch with the roof over my head with plenty of food in my kitchen. But I know that in the line of work that I'm involved in, there's many more vulnerable people around the world on our border, immigrants in our communities, people that are in, you know, just different economical brackets in our communities that aren't facing and dealing with this time the same that I am. And so maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And and I'm with you on And it's a word that people don't associate with me just cause I, I don't, I'm privileged. Mm-hmm. You know, when people tie that word to whites, it's like white privilege. Like people have privileges. All that privilege means is you don't have to worry about certain things. Mm. 
that's a, for me, that's all privilege means is like, I'm privileged because I don't have to worry about, you know, getting food. Like I have food, I have a house, I have a couch. Like you said, like we're privileged because we don't have to worry about certain things. Yeah. Now, do people have more privilege than us? Yes. And are people in more poverty than us? Yes. Yeah. And so I don't feel bad about where I'm at, but I also know that privilege means I, I know that I have a place to stay and I feel safe hmm. and I have the power to keep myself safe. That's, that's what I'm talking about right now in this pandemic. That's what yeah. privilege means to me. Hmm. It's not, you know, climbing the ladder, like get over that. We're a quarantine privilege yeah. for me means I can pay someone else to get groceries for me. Hmm. Privilege for me is that I don't have to get on public transportation right now yeah. to go to the grocery store and put my pregnant wife at risk because yeah. I needed to get food. Yeah. Privilege, yeah, that's what privilege means is I, I can get people to deliver food to me. You know, the students that I deal with, my immediate response was, okay, it's not a vacation. You know, we have a lot of kids come to our program on Thursday night, not because they love hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them do. And that's great. But some of them just don't want to be home. Hmm. And so they're with us from 430 to 8 once a week because that's the that's one day that they can just not be home. And so when I thought about okay, they have to be home all the time, like mm -hmm. even for school. I thought about all of our students that talked to me about abuse that's happening at home. This is, has nothing to do with the, you know, getting sick outside. Totally. It's not about catching COVID. It's, does this kid want to be at home around dad for that long? And mm -hmm. dad can't go to work. Hmm. And dad has a short temper. Yeah. And mom says negative things to them. And so my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, our kids are not excited about this at all. There's no escape from home. And and that's that's the reality. A lot of the students that we've worked with, but then also, do they have access to the internet? Do they have access to food? Can they get everything that they need? And then do they feel safe? Hmm. Uh, those, those are the things that I've just been, you know, praying for and through for my students. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. I think it's important for us to acknowledge uh, that because I think the acknowledgement, um, even if we're stuck at home right now, even if we're wrestling with this thought, like I think will eventually enable us to act. Enable, eventually, it will enable us when we can at the right time, right, to look out for the neighbor, to look out for that person that sometimes is considered the other, right, in our culture. And so mm -hmm. I just think that's. It, it's just so important and um i appreciate you opening up about that because those are i'm glad that i'm not the only one wrestling with that i just i think our hearts and our ministries reflect so much of uh, a vision and mission for others and so i think uh, it, you know the fact that we're both dealing with it in different ways is definitely not surprising at all one of the things that i really wanted to talk with you was about this idea of 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 how just words matter and labels that we put on ourselves or that we identify ourselves with in our culture also have a weight in the way that um you know those bring value to us and so part of the border trips that we do at border perspective and so part of the mm -hmm. curriculum that we um cover during this trip is we highlight conversations about the labels and terminology that we that we use to identify ourselves and others. And I often say this phrase that the labels that we put on each other, they have the opportunity to unite us or the power to divide us, right? And so as I look at myself and I even consider you working with a lot of different backgrounds of students, I see how we live in a world that we work with people that are very different, people that don't look alike, people that don't live alike, people that don't even vote alike, right? And so during this pandemic, what I've been as I've been scrolling through social media and listening to some of the people that I follow closely and that inspire me, that also challenge me, I've been seeing an uprising in discrimination toward Asian Americans because COVID-19 came from China. You know, I think in the last couple of weeks, I'm seeing reports that there's over a thousand incidents of racism and you know, those incidents are uh, on the rise as, as we're dealing with this. And I'm just, shocked at the fact that even in this very difficult time in our nation, right, like there is racism, in, an increase in racism right now towards uh, Asians and Asian American populations, 
Have you heard about mm-hmm. this? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I have heard about it, and it's it is heartbreaking. And the, the the thing that I know is that hate finds its root in fear. Hmm. I mean, that's what it is. At the end of the day, it's not these people just genuinely hate, you know, the Chinese people or hate black people or hate. It's there. There's an element of fear that is at the root of racism. Hmm. And then there is an inability and in, in, in a desire to, to, to maintain just where they are. There's not even being open to learn. Hmm. And so that, that's the problem is that it's fear that's wrapped around uh, this desire to not learn. Yeah. And so just that's what that's how I see it. And so I've got a phrase in my head that that just helps me put things in perspective. And it's just you showed me your cards like like you're playing cards. And, OK, you 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 use certain words and labels that you want to use. OK, I'm like, all right, I, now I know what you think. Mm hmm. Like now, now I know where you stand because you use that term. And sometimes I feel like I need to correct someone. And sometimes I just have to mentally note it. Okay. That's where they are. Now I know. And so that's how I've navigated, not giving it. I'm not saying that it's okay for people to say certain things for sure. But sometimes someone would say something that's offensive and I'd say, Hey, I'm offended by that. And even how they respond to that, like, well, well, why? Okay, you showed me your cards. You're not willing to learn, yeah. or oh, I'm so sorry. How did I how how did I offend you? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, you're open to learning, and so when someone responds like, oh, why why is that racist? That's stupid. And I'm like, okay, then I'm I'm not going to spend the time mm-hmm. to try to explain it to you because you're not a learner right now. Yeah. Or if someone really did not know that they offended or what they said was offensive, and you call them out on it, and they say, oh, I'm so sorry. Can you help me understand why? Yeah. Then, then that's an opportunity for, for me to teach. I just, I don't like wasting my time trying to teach someone that's not willing to learn. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, it's, it's extremely hard, right? To get, to get across in, in, in your thoughts and words, why are the, the labels and words that we use for other people so important? I mean, I, I think it helps us create safety for ourselves, you know, labels aren't necessarily bad. Like mm-hmm. labels help us navigate reality. Yeah. And so it, it, it helps us think about and navigate the world around us. And so they're not necessarily bad uh, to label certain things. However, it, it leads, it leads to misunderstanding if we just stay there. Yeah. And so, and some people will deliberately label things. So people know kind of where they stand, you know, not, not everyone thinks it's bad by calling it the Chinese virus. Like they just kind of say, well, it came from China. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. And they have, they have no idea what they're saying yeah. uh, actually is leading someone else down to a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, the stories that, that I, that I just hear about obviously, right. Are they have true repercussions, these words and statements and even labels are hurtful and even in some cases endangering certain people. And so I think about the Asian American population, you know, the community of people where they reside. And I can only be empathetic because um, I remember this is just coming to my mind a while back. I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, I had an incident where I think it was also, it was a misunderstanding, right? But it was about words and someone kind of attacking me personally. And I remember you were one of the first ones. I think I, we went into your backyard and your porch and I shared with you my heart of like, this just happened, right? And it was, um, and I knew that I couldn't go to someone else, but I knew I could go to you because you understood and I think there was an empathy mm-hmm. there that you shared with me that um, even though you didn't walk the situation that I had just walked through, but you empathized with me, right? And so I, I, I feel like the even just feel addressing it, knowing and being empathetic to what um, another community or population is going through is is so important in these times and even more important right now in the fact that we're all in the unknown we're all in the unprecedented we're all it's our human nature to you know to be fearful like yes i don't want to dismiss the promises of god right through the gospels but like 
that's just our human nature. Like we are anxious, we are fearful, but at the same time, we do have that hope, you know, for the future and the fact that through God's hope, he renews and, and restores all things. And so do you have any uh, suggestions? How can we be more intentional about uh, supporting, um, especially like the Asian and Asian American community right now, any tangibles or practical ways that you can think of? Not, it's not a really a tangible or practical right now, other than just reflect. Hmm. It's, I, I think right now we're forced to reflect on our foundations uh, we're forced to reflect on how we uh, think and how we feel and and who we're standing behind. What I've realized right now for myself, too, is where I find peace is where I'm putting my faith. Hmm. I'll say that again. Where I find peace is where I put my faith. And so when I'm looking at the COVID numbers, I'm like, oh, they're down in Minnesota. I feel at peace. Yeah. I'm putting faith in a number. Hmm. Like I'm just putting my faith in a number and, and that's the thing. Like, Oh, I go to the grocery store and I'm nervous, but I see toilet paper and I feel at peace. Hmm. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm putting my, my faith in, in the presence of toilet paper Yeah, and nothing against these things, but totally. until, until we're at this place where nobody's at peace, the thing is you need discomfort to actually experience peace. Hmm. You, you need pain to actually feel healing. Like yeah. if you're always healed, you don't know what you need healing for. And so, I mean, going back to Jesus, the reason why people don't want to believe in him is because once you get close to him, he reveals your true self and that's broken. Hmm. I mean, if you look at the gospels, when he looks and he, he talks to people, they're not like, oh my gosh, Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. They fall on their knees and say, oh my gosh, I'm such a sinful person. Go away from wow. me. Yeah. Like that, that's their natural reaction. The the natural reaction when you get face to face with Jesus is that you are broken, that you need forgiveness. And he doesn't leave us there though. That's the gospel. That's the good news. He doesn't stay there. He tells Peter, get up. I want you to fish for people. Like you have a purpose, but people don't want to go through the pain. They just want to rush to the peace. And mm-hmm. so I think right now, the best thing that we can do for ourselves will lead to the best thing we can do for others. Hmm. And that is being a whole and healthy person, which means figure out why you're offended, figure out why you're angry, figure out why uh, you hate certain people. Because one of the things that helps me kind of bring a a perspective to to people that are doing ignorant things Mm -hmm. or people are doing things that I disagree with. Yeah. I used to rush to this question. What is wrong with them? Hmm. What's wrong with that person? Right. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. just naturally I see someone do something or what's wrong with this kid. Why would he act like that? Yeah. Instead of rushing there, I just step back and I say, what happened? What happened to them? Hmm. What happened to this person that they would, see a Chinese person and want to harm them because of this. Like what ha- like how- they didn't get there when they walked into Costco, like mm. something happened before that. And it doesn't give them permission to do whatever they want, but it gives me space to like back up and not just judge right away, but just to say, man, people are broken. What happened to that person? Mm. And, and I've realized that more having kids and I'm sure you've seen it too. Kids are naturally just joyful. They, they, they go out there and they just, they don't see lines. They don't see races. They just run up to people and they see a person. Yeah. We're the ones that tell them, Hey, back up. Don't talk to that person. Like we're the ones that do that. Like the kids are like, Oh, there's a human. Let me say hi. Yeah. And, and so I, I think the thing that will help us is, is just really reflecting on ourselves in this moment and just saying, Hey, what brings me peace? What is my foundation? Yeah. Like, well, why, why am I, why am I so angry or why, why am I thinking these things? Um, and that will help us get to where we need to go. Wow. That's good. That's good. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think you're even just to hearing you 
right now it's encouraging me and challenging me and, and motivating me even in the, in this time of waiting you know that we find ourselves in and so continue to keep in, in mind right um, all those that are in the front lines uh, the pe- the the healthcare workers the people that are providing you know food for our tables I mean the reality is there's there's a lot of communities and populations that that are keeping Americans fed and Americans healthy and even pushing through you know the sickness that that is in our hospitals and in our uh, healthcare, and so um, I appreciate Cesar uh, you spending this time with us. Thank you for for sharing the, your time with us today. Is there anything else that you want to leave us with? Yeah, I mean, I'm thankful for our our friendship, Jan, and I, I know that we haven't walked the same path, but we have you know similar stories. And one of the things that has helped me, uh, you know expand my vision for for myself and for others is really seeking the perspective of other people Hmm. that has helped me because it expands your your i can't deny your experience so i have to ask and i have to give you space to tell your story that's the only way out of this thing yeah because i've been part of the you know multicultural multi-ethnic panels and to talk about my perspective Uh and i get so sick of those panels (laughs) They're needed. Don't tell me like, oh, he doesn't want to be on our panel. I'll be on your panel if you need me to be there. Yeah. But the thing that changes lives and perspectives is life on life storytelling. Hmm. That's it. I mean, there's no way around that. You can't go to a conference for that. You can't go to a workshop. You can't get it online. It is you coming over on my porch telling me what happened at Home Depot. Yeah. And me watching you and seeing you kind of fumble your words to kind of speak through your anger and sadness at the same time. And it's me just processing that and saying, I see the pain. I don't know what to say, but I see that it's painful, yeah. you know, and until we have interactions with other people that that don't think or look like us, we're only going to gravitate towards people that will confirm our bias biases. Like, that's it. Hmm. And so just intentionally seeking perspectives that are not your own and giving people space to tell their story. Yeah. Like that's, it's simple, but that's powerful. Yeah. So thanks for the opportunity. I hope to, you know, continue the conversation with you. Well, thanks again. And so are you online at all? Where can people find your thoughts, some of your work and just kind of keep up with what you're doing? I am on uh, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'm not as active on snapchat and like the <laughs> TikTok, you know, instagram you but TikTok? Just, i i do have one but i feel like i just have it just because everyone else has it and, yeah yeah um but you can find you can google me you'll probably find my dad too because they're the same <laughs> name but cesar one of one with the numbers is is my handle for a few of those so c-e-s-a-r one o-f one and you'll you'll find me Perfect. Again, Cesar, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. And thank you so much for your thoughts and your work. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Peacemakers. If there's anything that stood out to you from this conversation, we'll post links about it in our show notes. So make sure to check those out. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Peacemakers. Wherever you subscribe to podcasts, go ahead and hit subscribe. Please leave us a positive review on iTunes and share this episode with your friends through Instagram stories on Spotify. And most importantly, don't forget to join us for our next exciting episode. Peacemakers podcast is made possible by Border Perspective. Border Perspective partners with ministry leaders and organizations to host conversations on social and biblical issues that help equip the church to love our neighbor the way God intended. You can also join Border Perspective on a service learning trip along the southern border. These trips are immersive, educational, and intentionally place you into the lives of immigrant leaders serving families on the South Texas and Mexico border. To learn more about how you can join Border Perspective's peacemaking mission, visit Border Perspective dot org.